Hi everyone. I'm sorry I can't be there with you today. Uh, yesterday in class we covered an activity where we looked at specific words and how they've evolved over time. So if one example being how the word nice hasn't always meant something so nice or how the word awful used to mean something very positive when it doesn't anymore. And so today we need to shift our focus along that same vein though to talk about verbal versus nonverbal communication. And so go ahead and get you some notes out and really look at the fact here that when we say verbal versus nonverbal, we're looking at verbal and we're looking at nonverbal. So they're going to be similar. They're definitely going to um, interact with each other as we communicate, but we need a basic understanding of this before we can move on. So let's start with verbal communication. And we're going to define verbal communication as using language to communicate. Verbal communication is using language to communicate. So the first thing I want you to really think about when you conceptualize verbal communication is we're looking at verbal communication to be the words that we choose within the language that we use. So we could talk about verbal communication in a variety of languages, English, Spanish, French, German, Mandarin, Japanese, Korean, whatever language you wanna choose, American Sign Language even. But the thing to remember is that we're looking at those language choices, not how it sounds, but what are the language choices. So obviously language is a pretty big part of it, so we need to look at, well, what does language mean? And if you put a bunch of different experts in, that, in language and studying language and linguistics in the same room at the same time, you're going to get a bunch of different answers to that question of what does language mean? So we're gonna at least try to skim the surface today of what that does mean. So let's look at language. And first let's define it as a system of sounds and symbols used to communicate ideas and feelings. A system of sounds and symbols used to communicate ideas and feelings. A system of sounds and symbols used to communicate ideas and feelings. So obviously let's break this down. We have a system of sounds and symbols remembering that symbols refer to a thing that represents another thing. Um, and we're looking at it to communicate. Remember communication we're trying to create that shared meaning between sender and receiver using symbols. Um, and But it's not just the symbols themselves. We have to think about the sounds that those symbols make. And then we're communicating ideas and feelings here. So it's a very imprecise definition. So let's go ahead and go into some more specifics. So the first thing is that language is a system. Language is a system. And language is a system, you know, think about it. Well, what is a system? A system is something made up of multiple parts. You know, think about the body. We have the digestive system, the cardiovascular system, the muscular system. And so language is built in that very same way where it's made up of multiple parts. And really, the we have three parts that are really important. And uh, I would like you to jot these down. So we have first that language is made up of sounds, so which is the study of phonology, P-H-O-N-O-L-O-G-Y, phonology. So the sounds that we're capable of making as human beings that are, or the basic sounds that we can make as human beings that go into a specific language. We then take those sounds and we put them into words. So we combine those different sounds and we put them into words, and that's morphology, M-O-R-P-H-O-L-O-G-Y, morphology. And then we take those words and we arrange them. So we get this arrangement idea when we talk about syntax, S-Y-N-T-A-X, syntax. 
And so when we think about syntax, we're looking at how we choose our words and arrange those into sentences and then into paragraphs. So we look at them, so basically we start with the basic level of a sound and that starts to evolve and that all makes up the language system. Second though, language is symbolic. It is socially constructed. Language only exists because we as human beings have created it over time. And as we saw through our activity yesterday, that changes over time. Sometimes words and language is really adequate for the time and sometimes it no longer is acceptable. Think about a lot of, you know, there are some very derogatory terms that we view as derogatory today that if you go back 50 or 100 or 150 years ago were very commonplace. And it was because at the time it was socially acceptable. That doesn't make it socially acceptable to say some terms like that today. But that also means on the flip side of that, that words only have the power that we grant them. Uh, I think a good example is, um, one example of this could be when, uh, after President Trump referred to other candidates, other female candidates specifically in the um, Republican field as nasty, then other than women across the board started to wear the nasty name as a badge of honor. So really flipping the, the meaning there, even though we typically think of nasty being a negative thing. Third, language is conventional. This means that it's accepted by a large number of people. Well, how many people is a large number of people? It just kind of depends. Obviously, English is a language and Mandarin is a language that are widely accepted. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that that's the end of the ball game. I mean, there are languages that are spoken by, you know, individual tribes in very rural Japan or very rural parts of South America where their language is still able to be passed on from one generation to the next. That being said, languages are actually dying off. There are a number of languages that are no longer existing just because they aren't conventional anymore. They aren't accepted by this large number of people and they, the people just don't know the rules of those languages. But this finally, that leads into our final thing about language and that is language is learned. We don't, we aren't born knowing a language. We have to learn that language over time. And so we think about it, this works kind of like this. We start pretty simple, you know, we start with things like mama, dada, whatever we can get our mouth around, but then we become more complex. So we start with short words and easy symbols and we work our way up. And then once we learn rules, we start overgeneralizing. So, you know, and I, an example of that would be when we are younger, you maybe have younger siblings, you might remember this, or cousins, or just you're around younger children, and they'll add like ED to everything. So they learn that, well, if I add ED, that means it's past tense. Well, all of a sudden, instead of saying I went, they're, start, they're now saying I goed. And we know that I goed isn't correct because we have to learn more rules. But then the last thing is, we understand more symbols than we ever fully use or fully understand. So, you know, there are words that you might hear and you kind of, you basically get what it means, but you don't really know what it means or you would never use it yourself. And so that's just kind of what part of language is being learned is all about. We know more symbols than we will ever use or fully understand. So this is the rough definition of language. It's a system, it's symbolic, it's conventional, and it's learned. Now, within language, some words have multiple meanings. So the first type of meaning a word has is the denotative meaning, and that's simply the dictionary definition. The denotative meaning is the dictionary definition. So some examples, this is a flag. If I looked up what a flag is, it would probably say a piece of cloth that would represent a country or an idea, but that's the denotative meaning. This is a picture of a dove. The denotative meaning of a dove is a bird that is white and can fly. And I'm overgeneralizing here at the dictionary definitions, of course. And this last one is 
the idea of cake. Okay, cake is a sugary um, dessert that we enjoy typically on birthdays and sometimes on special occasions. Now, I want you to keep these three examples in mind because the de denotative meaning, that dictionary definition, is sometimes different than the connotative meaning. The connotative meaning refers to the feelings and associations aroused by the word. And so as we examined yesterday, the denotative and the connotative meanings really change over time. They're not stationary, they're not stagnant. So think about it, we see an American flag. For some people, we might think the stars and stripes, we might think glory and bravery and democracy and freedom and justice. But someone else could look at this flag, whether they live here or not, and they could be just repulsed. How, you know, they could see it as a symbol for imperialism and a, a symbol for injustice and a symbol for, you know, um, uh, I think injustice is really the best way to put it because for whatever reason, our country has wronged them. You know, going to the dove. The dove could, maybe we see a dove or we hear the word dove and we think of the soap, the soap brand dove. Or we think about how a dove in, in its all of its white glory represents purity. So, you know, these are different feelings, associations aroused by the word. And we think of cake, you know, I may have made you incredibly hungry now because now all you can think about is cake. But the other thing is you might have a specific feeling around cake. For example, back to the example, um, you know, when we were talking about uh, learned communication apprehension and I indicated that my brother would bawl when he would sing happy birthday, maybe part of it was he had a bad experience with cake. And so that was a negative feeling. He knew happy birthday was being sung and cake was coming next. Um, you know, maybe there's happy memories because for that was, you know, for example, my mom actually made cakes uh, as like a part time job. And so I it was something that I always look forward to having her delicious cakes. And I love cake because of that. And you know, that can be anything in between. And we can have those feelings even when we just see the word, not even when we actually see cake. And we're probably also all imagining our own type of cake. So those are the, that's denotative and connotative meaning. The dictionary definition and the feelings and associated associations aroused by the word. I just want to talk about standard and non-standard English for just a minute here. Um, obviously, standard English here, it's what follows the rules and guidelines for the language. Um, we don't always follow these rules, but if we were always following standard English, we're following grammatical rules. When we're speaking to, I'm not talking even here about writing, I'm talking about when we speak as well. And actually I'm really more focusing on speaking and making sure that we use complete sentences and we use certain word choice that would be within the rules and guidelines for the English language. More often than not though, we use non-standard English. And so this is what violates or does not closely follow the rules and conventions of the language. Um, <laughs> honestly, this is what we all do most of the time. Um, most of the people that speak English don't speak standard English. They speak some type of dialect that violates the rules. Um, I think of a Southern dialect or a, a Midwestern dialect or a Boston, you know, Boston accent, um, a New York accent, a Chicago accent, all these different things. And it's one of those things that we don't even realize we do it until we go somewhere where we're not from. So, for example, I think about any time I travel to the southern United States, everyone says I clearly from the Midwest because I speak so quickly. And I do speak pretty quickly. So do most of us in this room. It's just kind of what comes along with that. Now, within non-standard English, though, there are a couple of subsets. So the first thing we need to think about is jargon. So jargon is language understood by a particular group or field. Language understood by a particular group or field. So now with jargon, we look at the fact that we have this language uh, that, you know, medical jargon. So I think a great example is my fiance is uh, in physical therapy school and on a regular basis she will she and I will be talking and I will say you know I just this I have, I have a pain in my calf 
And then she will rattle off the name of the muscle and I will look back at her and say, if that's my calf, then yes, you're correct. Um, I'm not, I, I don't have medical jargon, particularly in my field set, in my mindset, in my field of experience, but she does. On the flip side, I talk about a lot of education jargon or speech jargon. Speech team actually seems to have its own jargon with the names of events and everything. Uh, there's theater jargon. There is uh, engineering jargon. There's, I mean, pick a, a field you could go into or a group. Even here at UHI, we have jargon. We call the, la the our student gathering area on the first floor the lounge. We call our library, the library, where maybe some other schools refer to their library as a media center. Um, you know, there are just any number of things. We have the pit, which we all know that that's a specific door that people come in and out. So that's, we have our own jargon even here within UHI and in our culture. The other thing though would be slang. So newly coined words or old words brought back with a new meaning. Newly coined words or old words brought back with a new meaning. Slang really comes down to uh, different terms nowadays that you can look up on Urban Dictionary because they're new words that don't have a meaning and believe it or not, yes, teachers know exactly uh, where to look when we don't understand a word that students say to us. Um, but you know, it doesn't always have to be nefarious. It doesn't always have to be evil. It can be the idea of you know we talked about the word nice. You know, someone referring something. You know, if someone does something cool or something's going great, someone might say nice. Okay, that's slang. Um, it could be you know I think back to uh, back the Back to the Future movie, the original one, and Marty McFly. The Marty McFly character kept keeps saying the word heavy every time he, you know, he, he something is you know interesting to him or whatever. And he's back in 1955. In 1955, Doc Brown doesn't understand him, and so you know this whole idea of slang is always constantly evolving. And it seems with social media and technology that slang just I mean it's almost every six months uh, there are new slang words out there. So that's verbal communication. If we talk about nonverbal communication for just a minute, we can, we'll go a little more in depth when I'm back with you tomorrow. But when we look at nonverbal communication, we're really talking about all communication other than words. All communication other than words. And so what we're looking at here with nonverbal communication is it does a few things. The first thing is that nonverbal communication, MVC, complements verbal communication. So that means that the words that we say go with how we say them. So for example, if I say, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss after you've lost a family member or a pet or someone significant to you, I want that to sound like I mean it. I'm not going to say it with a smile on my face and, oh, I am so sorry for your loss. You know, I want to say it in a way that, that communicates empathy. Nonverbal communication also emphasizes verbal communication. Nonverbal communication emphasizes verbal communication. So this comes along with making sure maybe one thing you do is you make direct eye contact with someone and you gesture at a specific point. Maybe when you want to have that specific emphasis, you also emphasize your voice a little bit more. So there are a number of ways in which that can happen and you can have that emphasis. The third thing that nonverbal communication can do is it can replace verbal communication. So I think about here is I think about a little bit of um, when you give that look to a friend of yours and they know exactly what you mean. So you don't need to say anything because all you have to do is give them a look and they know if you approve or disapprove of whatever's going on. So kind of those looks, or I'm sure your parents have that same look that your parents don't even have to say anything to you when you know that they're, they're mad at you. They can just give you a dirty look. 
That would be an example of how nonverbal communication can replace verbal communication. And then finally, nonverbal communication contradicts verbal communication. So I think sarcasm is the best example here. So, you know, I can look at someone and say, oh, hey, I really like your shirt and, and actually mean it. Or maybe I don't like their shirt. So I might say, hey, nice shirt. And then I kind of give them a look and, you know, and this sneering vo you know, tone to the end of my voice there would make it sound like it contradicts. The other thing would be, you know, let's say you're not really sorry about something and you say you're sorry, but you can't say it with a straight face or you can't, you know, you can't have your tone match it, whatever that may be, it can contradict it. And that can be to your benefit, but it also can be to your detriment. It can also, you know, work against you there as well. So we're going to apply this now. So uh, you're going to watch President Obama's 2004 Democratic National Convention speech. So you're going to fill out the worksheet that will be passed out to you. You're going to look for examples of verbal communication as well as nonverbal communication and record those in the appropriate part of the worksheet. So I'll let you get to work on that. And if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask me tomorrow. Thanks.